Chapter fifty five Tempest I now approach an event in my life so indelible, so awful, so bound by an infinite variety of ties to all that has preceded it in these pages, that from the beginning of my narrative I have seen it growing larger and larger as I advanced, like a great tower in a plain, and throwing its forecast shadow even on the incidents of my childish days. For years after it occurred I dreamed of it often. I have started up so vividly impressed by it that its fury has yet seemed raging in my quiet room in the still night. I dream of it sometimes, though it lengthened and uncertain intervals, to this hour. I have an association between it and the stormy wind or the lightest mention of a seashore, as strong as any of which my mind is conscious. As plainly as I behold what happened, I will try to write it down. I do not recall it, but see it done, for it happens again before me. The time drawing on rapidly for the sailing of the emigrant ship, my good old nurse, almost broken-hearted for me when we first met, came up to London. I was constantly with her and her brother and the Micawbers, they being very much together, but Emily I never saw. One evening, when the time was close at hand, I was alone with Peggotty and her brother. Our conversation turned on Ham. She described to us how tenderly he had taken leave of her, and how manfully and quietly he had borne himself most of all of late when she believed he was most tried it was a subject of which the affectionate creature never tired and our interest in hearing the many examples which she who was so much with him had to relate was equal to hers in relating them my aunt and i were at that time vacating the two cottages at highgate i intending to go abroad and she to return to her house at dover we had a temporary lodging in Covent Garden. As I walked home to it after this evening's conversation, reflecting on what had passed between Ham and myself when I was last at Yarmouth, I wavered in the original purpose I had formed of leaving a letter for Emily when I should take leave of her uncle on board the ship, and thought it would be better to write to her now. She might desire, I thought, after receiving my communication, to send some parting word by me to her unhappy lover. I ought to give her the opportunity. I therefore sat down in my room before going to bed and wrote to her. I told her that I had seen him, and that he had requested me to tell her what I have already written in its place in these sheets. I faithfully repeated it. I had no need to enlarge upon it, if I had had the right. Its deep fidelity and goodness were not to be adorned by me or any man. I left it out to be sent round in the morning, with a line to Mr. Peggotty, requesting him to give it to her, and went to bed at daybreak. I was weaker than I knew then, and, not falling asleep until the sun was up, lay late and unrefreshed next day. I was roused by the silent presence of my aunt by my bedside. I felt it in my sleep, as I suppose we all do feel such things. "'Trot, my dear,' she said when I opened my eyes. "'I couldn't make up my mind to disturb you. Mr. Peggotty is here. Shall he come up?' I replied yes, and he soon appeared. "'Master Davy,' he said when we had shaken hands. I give Emily your letter, sir, and she writ this here, and beg me for to ask you to read it, and if you see no hurt in't, to be so kind as to take charge on't. Have you read it? said I. He nodded sorrowfully. I opened it and read as follows. I have got your message. Oh, what can I write to thank you for your good and blessed kindness to me? I have put the words close to my heart. I shall keep them till I die. They are sharp thorns, but they are such comfort. I have prayed over them, oh, I have prayed so much. When I find what you are and what uncle is, I think what God must be, and can cry to him. Good-bye for ever. Now, my dear friend, good-bye for ever in this world. In another world, if I am forgiven, I may wake a child and come to you. All thanks and blessings. Farewell evermore. This, blotted with tears, was the letter. May I tell her as you do and see no hurt in't? "'And as you'll be so kind as to take charge on't, Master Davy,' said Mr. Peggotty, when I had read it. "'Unquestionably,' said I. "'But I am thinking—' "'Yes, Master Davy?' "'I am thinking,' said I, "'that I'll go down again to Yarmouth. "'There's time, and to spare, for me to go and come back before the ship sails. "'My mind is constantly running on him in his solitude. "'To put this letter of her writing in his hand at this time, "'and to enable you to tell her in the moment of parting that he has got it, "'will be a kindness to both of them. "'I solemnly accepted his commission, dear good fellow, "'and cannot discharge it too completely. 
The journey is nothing to me. I am restless, and shall be better in motion. I'll go down to-night. Though he anxiously endeavoured to dissuade me, I saw that he was of my mind, and this, if I had required to be confirmed in my intention, would have had the effect. He went round to the coach-office, at my request, and took the box-seat for me on the mail. In the evening I started, by that conveyance, down the road I had traversed under so many vicissitudes. "'Don't you think that?' I asked the coachman in the first stage out of London. "'A very remarkable sky. I don't remember to have seen one like it.' "'Nor I, not equal to it,' he replied. "'That's wind, sir. There'll be mischief done at sea, I expect, before long.' It was a murky confusion, here and there blotted with a colour like the colour of the smoke from damp fuel, of flying clouds tossed up into most remarkable heaps, suggesting greater heights in the clouds than there were depths below them to the bottom of the deepest hollows on the earth, through which the wild moon seemed to plunge headlong, as if, in the dread disturbance of the laws of nature, she had lost her way and were frightened. There had been a wind all day, and it was rising then with an extraordinary great sound. In another hour it had much increased, and the sky was more overcast and blew hard. But as the night advanced, the clouds closing in and densely overspreading the whole sky, then very dark, it came on to blow harder and harder. It still increased until our horses could scarcely face the wind. Many times in the dark part of the night, it was then late in September, when the nights were not short, the leaders turned about or came to a dead stop, and we were often in serious apprehension that the coach would be blown over. Sweeping gusts of rain came up before this storm like showers of steel, and at those times, when there was any shelter of trees or lee of walls to be got, we were fain to stop, in a sheer impossibility of continuing the struggle. When the day broke, it blew harder and harder. I had been in Yarmouth when the seamen said it blew great guns, but I had never known the like of this, or anything approaching to it. We came to Ipswich very late, having had to fight every inch of ground since we were ten miles out of London. We found a cluster of people in the market-place, who had risen from their beds in the night fearful of falling chimneys. Some of these, congregating about the inn-yard while we changed horses, told us of great sheets of lead having been ripped off the high church tower, and flung into a by-street, which they then blocked up. Others had to tell of country people coming up from neighbouring villages who had seen great trees lying torn out of the earth, and whole ricks scattered about the roads and fields. Still there was no abatement in the storm, but it blew harder. As we struggled on, nearer and nearer to the sea, from which this mighty wind was blowing dead on shore, its force became more and more terrific. Long before we saw the sea, its spray was on our lips and showered salt rain upon us. The water was out over miles and miles of the flat country adjacent to Yarmouth, and every sheet and puddle lashed its banks, and had its stress of little breakers setting heavily towards us. When we came within sight of the sea, the waves of the horizon caught at intervals above the rolling abyss were like glimpses of another shore with towers and buildings. When at last we got into the town, the people came out to their doors, all aslant and with streaming hair, making a wonder of the mail that had come through such a night. I put up at the old inn and went down to look at the sea, staggering along the street, which was strewn with sand and seaweed and with flying blotches of sea-foam, afraid of falling slates and tiles and holding by people I met at angry corners. Coming near the beach I saw not only the boatmen, but half the people of the town lurking behind buildings, some now and then braving the fury of the storm to look away to sea, and blown sheer out of their course in trying to get zigzag back. Joining these groups I found bewailing women whose husbands were away in herring or oyster-boats, which there was too much reason to think might have foundered before they could run in anywhere for safety. Grizzled old sailors were among the people, shaking their heads, as they looked from water to sky, and muttering to one another. Ship-owners, excited and uneasy, children huddling together and peering into older faces, even stout mariners, disturbed and anxious, levelling their glasses at the sea from behind places of shelter, as if they were surveying an enemy. The tremendous sea itself, when I could find sufficient pause to look at it, in the agitation of the blinding wind, the flying stones and sand, and the awful noise, confounded me. As the high watery walls came rolling in, and at the highest tumbled into surf, they looked as if the least would engulf the town. 
As the receding waves swept back with a hoarse roar, it seemed to scoop out deep caves in the beach, as if its purpose were to undermine the earth. When some white-headed billows thundered on and dashed themselves to pieces before they reached the land, every fragment of the late hole seemed possessed by the full might of its wrath, rushing to be gathered to the composition of another monster. Undulating hills were changed into valleys, undulating valleys, with a solitary storm-bird sometimes skimming through them, were lifted up to hills. Masses of water shivered and shook the beach with a booming sound. Every shape tumultuously rolled on as soon as made, to change its shape and place, and beat another shape and place away. The ideal shore of the horizon, with its towers and buildings, rose and fell. The clouds fell fast and thick. I seemed to see a rending and upheaving of all nature. Not finding harm among the people whom this memorable wind, for it is still remembered down there as the greatest ever known to blow upon that coast, had brought together, I made my way to his house. It was shut, and as no one answered to my knocking, I went by back ways and by-lanes to the yard where he worked. I learned there that he had gone to Lowestoft to meet some sudden exigency of ship repairing, in which his skill was required, but that he would be back to-morrow in good time. I went back to the inn, and when I had washed and dressed and tried to sleep, but in vain, it was five o'clock in the afternoon. I had not sat five minutes by the coffee-room fire, when the waiter, coming to stir it, as an excuse for talking, told me that two colliers had gone down, with all hands, a few miles away, and that some other ships had been seen labouring hard in the roads, and trying in great distress to keep off shore. Mercy on them and all poor sailors, he said, if we had another night like the last. I was very much depressed in spirits, very solitary, and felt an uneasiness in Ham's not being there, disproportionate to the occasion. I was seriously affected, without knowing how much, by late events, and my long exposure to the fierce wind had confused me. There was that jumble in my thoughts and recollections, that I had lost the clear arrangement of time and distance. Thus, if I had gone out into the town, I should not have been surprised, I think, to encounter someone who I knew must be then in London. So to speak, there was in these respects a curious inattention in my mind. Yet it was busy, too, with all the remembrances the place naturally awakened, and they were particularly distinct and vivid. In this state, the waiter's dismal intelligence about the ships immediately connected itself, without any effort in my volition, with my uneasiness about Ham. I was persuaded that I had an apprehension of his returning from Lowestoft by sea, and being lost. This grew so strong with me that I resolved to go back to the yard before I took my dinner, and ask the boat-builder if he thought his attempting to return by sea at all likely. If he gave me the least reason to think so, I would go over to Lowestoft and prevent it, by bringing him with me. I hastily ordered my dinner and went back to the yard. I was none too soon, for the boat-builder, with a lantern in his hand, was locking the yard gate. He quite laughed at me when I asked him the question, and said there was no fear, no man in his senses or out of them would put off in such a gale of wind, least of all Ham Peggotty, who had been born to seafaring. So sensible of this beforehand, that I had really felt ashamed of doing what I was nevertheless impelled to do, I went back to the inn. If such a wind could rise, I think it was rising. The howl and roar, the rattling of the doors and windows, the rumbling in the chimneys, the apparent rocking of the very house that sheltered me, and the prodigious tumult of the sea, were more fearful than in the morning. But there was now a great darkness besides, and that invested the storm with new terrors, real and fanciful. I could not eat, I could not sit still, I could not continue steadfast to anything. Something within me, faintly answering to the storm without, tossed up the depths of my memory and made a tumult in them. Yet in all the hurry of my thoughts, wild running with the thundering sea, the storm and my uneasiness regarding Ham were always in the foreground. My dinner went away almost untasted, and I tried to refresh myself with a glass or two of wine. In vain. I fell into a dull slumber before the fire, without losing my consciousness, either of the uproar out of doors, or of the place in which I was. Both became overshadowed by a new and indefinable horror, and when I awoke, or rather when I shook off the lethargy that bound me in my chair, my whole frame thrilled with an objectless and unintelligible fear. 
I walked to and fro, tried to read an old gazetteer, listened to the awful noises, looked at faces, scenes, and figures in the fire. At length the steady ticking of the undisturbed clock on the wall tormented me to that degree that I resolved to go to bed. It was reassuring on such a night to be told that some of the inn-servants had agreed together to sit up until morning. I went to bed exceedingly weary and heavy, but on my lying down all such sensations vanished as if by magic, and I was broad awake with every sense refined. For hours I lay there, listening to the wind and water, imagining now that I heard shrieks out at sea, now that I distinctly heard the firing of signal-guns, and now the fall of houses in the town. I got up several times and looked out, but could see nothing except the reflection in the window-panes of the faint candle I had left burning, and of my own haggard face looking in at me from the black void. At length my restlessness attained such a pitch that I hurried on my clothes and went downstairs. In the large kitchen, where I dimly saw bacon and ropes of onions hanging from the beams, the watchers were clustered together in various attitudes about a table, purposely moved away from the great chimney and brought near the door. A pretty girl, who had her ears stopped up with her apron and her eyes upon the door, screamed when I appeared, supposing me to be a spirit. But the others had more presence of mind and were glad of an addition to their company. One man, referring to the topic they had been discussing, asked me whether I thought the souls of the collier crews who had gone down were out in the storm. I remained there, I dare say, two hours. Once I opened the yard gate and looked into the empty street. The sand, the seaweed, and the flakes of foam were driving by, and I was obliged to call for assistance before I could shut the gate again and make it fast against the wind. There was a dark gloom in my solitary chamber when I at length returned to it. But I was tired now, and, getting into bed again, fell off a tower and down a precipice into the depths of sleep. I have an impression that for a long time, though I dreamed of being elsewhere and in a variety of scenes, it was always blowing in my dream. At length I lost that feeble hold upon reality and was engaged with two dear friends, but who they were I don't know, at the siege of some town in a roar of cannonading. The thunder of the cannon was so loud and incessant that I could not hear something which I much desired to hear, until I made a great exertion and awoke. It was broad day, eight or nine o'clock, the storm raging in lieu of the batteries, and someone knocking and calling at my door. "'What is the matter?' I cried. "'A wreck, close by!' I sprung out of bed and asked, "'What wreck?' "'A schooner from Spain or Portugal, laden with fruit and wine. "'Make haste, sir, if you want to see her. "'It's thought down on the beach she'll go to pieces every moment.' "'The excited voice went clamouring along the staircase, "'and I wrapped myself in my clothes as quickly as I could "'and ran into the street. "'Numbers of people were there before me, "'all running in one direction to the beach. "'I ran the same way, outstripping a good many, "'and soon came facing the wild sea.' the wind might by this time have lulled a little though not more sensibly than if the cannonading i had dreamed of had been diminished by the silencing of half a dozen guns out of hundreds but the sea having upon it the additional agitation of the whole night was infinitely more terrific than when i had seen it last every appearance it had then presented bore the expression of being swelled and the height to which the breakers rose and looking over one another bore one another down and rolled in in interminable hosts was most appalling in the difficulty of hearing anything but the wind and waves and in the crowd and the unspeakable confusion and my first breathless efforts to stand against the weather i was so confused that i looked out to sea for the wreck and saw nothing but the foaming heads of the great waves a half-dressed boatman standing next to me pointed with his bare arm a tattooed arrow on it pointing in the same direction to the left then, oh great heaven, I saw it, close in upon us. One of the masts was broken short off, six or eight feet from the deck, and lay over the side entangled in a maze of sail and rigging, and all that ruin as the ship rolled and beat, which she did without a moment's pause, and with a violence quite inconceivable, beat the side as if it would stave it in. Some efforts were even then being made to cut this portion of the wreck away, for, as the ship which was broadside on turned towards us in her rolling, I plainly descried her people at work with axes, especially one active figure with long curling hair conspicuous among the rest. 
but a great cry, which was audible even above the wind and water, rose from the shore at this moment. The sea, sweeping over the rolling wreck, made a clean breach, and carried men, spars, casks, planks, bulwarks, heaps of such toys, into the boiling surge. The second mast was yet standing, with the rags of a rent sail, and a wild confusion of broken cordage flapping to and fro. The ship had struck once, the same boatman hoarsely said in my ear, and then lifted in and struck again. I understood him to add that she was parting amid ships, and I could readily suppose so, for the rolling and beating were too tremendous for any human work to suffer long. As he spoke there was another great cry for pity from the beach. Four men arose with the wreck out of the deep, clinging to the rigging of the remaining mast, uppermost the active figure with the curling hair. There was a bell on board, and as the ship rolled and dashed like a desperate creature driven mad, now showing us the whole sweep of her deck, as she turned on her beam-ends towards the shore, now nothing but her keel, as she sprung wildly over and turned towards the sea, the bell rang, and its sound, the knell of those unhappy men, was borne towards us on the wind. Again we lost her, and again she rose. Two men were gone. The agony on the shore increased, men groaned and clasped their hands, women shrieked and turned away their faces, some ran wildly up and down along the beach, crying for help where no help could be. I found myself one of these, frantically imploring a knot of sailors whom I knew not to let those two lost creatures perish before our eyes. They were making out to me in an agitated way, I don't know how, for the little I could hear was scarcely composed enough to understand, that the lifeboat had been bravely manned an hour ago and could do nothing, and that as no man would be so desperate as to attempt to wade off with a rope and establish a communication with the shore, there was nothing left to try. When I noticed that some new sensation moved the people on the beach, and then I saw them part and Ham come breaking through them to the front. I ran to him, as well as I know, to repeat my appeal for help, but distracted though I was by a sight so new to me and terrible, the determination on his face and his look out to sea, exactly the same look as I remembered in connection with the morning after Emily's flight, awoke me to a knowledge of his danger. I held him back with both arms, and implored the men with whom I had been speaking not to listen to him, not to do murder, not to let him stir from off that sand. Another cry arose on shore, and looking out to the wreck, we saw the cruel sail, with blow on blow, beat off the lower of the two men, and fly up in triumph round the active figure left alone upon the mast. Against such a sight, and against such determination as that of the calmly desperate man who was already accustomed to lead half the people present, I might as hopefully have entreated the wind. Master Davy! he said, cheerfully grasping me by both hands. If my time is come, tis come. If tan't, I'll bide it. Lord above bless you and bless all. Mates, make me ready. I'm a-going off. I was swept away, but not unkindly, to some distance, where the people around me made me stay, urging, as I confusedly perceived, that he was bent on going, with help or without, and that I should endanger the precautions for his safety by troubling those with whom they rested. I don't know what I answered, or what they rejoined, but I saw hurry on the beach, and men running with ropes from a capstan that was there, and penetrating into a circle of figures that hid him from me. Then I saw him standing alone, in a seaman's frock and trousers, a rope in his hand, or slung to his wrist, another around his body, and several of the best men holding, at a little distance, to the ladder, which he laid out himself slack upon the shore at his feet. The wreck, even to my unpractised eye, was breaking up. I saw that she was parting in the middle, and that the life of the solitary man upon the mast hung by a thread. Still he clung to it. He had a singular red cap on, not like a sailor's cap, but of a finer colour, and as the few yielding planks between him and destruction rolled and bulged, and his anticipative death-knell rang, he was seen by all of us to wave it. I saw him do it now and thought I was going distracted when his action brought an old remembrance to my mind of a once dear friend. Ham watched the sea, standing alone, with the silence of suspended breath behind him and the storm before, until there was a great retiring wave, then, with a backward glance at those who held the rope, which was made fast round his body, he dashed in after it and in a moment was buffeting with the water, rising with the hills, falling with the valleys, lost beneath the foam, 
then drawn again to land. They hauled in hastily. He was hurt. I saw blood on his face from where I stood, but he took no thought of that. He seemed hurriedly to give them some directions for leaving him more free, or so I judged from the motion of his arm, and was gone as before. He now made for the wreck, rising with the hills, falling with the valleys, lost beneath the rugged foam, borne in towards the shore, borne on towards the ship, striving hard and valiantly. The distance was nothing, but the power of the sea and wind made the strife deadly. At length he neared the wreck. He was so near that with one more of his vigorous strokes he would be clinging to it when a high, green, vast hillside of water, moving on shoreward from beyond the ship, he seemed to leap up into it with a mighty bound, and the ship was gone. Some eddying fragments I saw in the sea, as if a mere cask had been broken, in running to the spot where they were hauling in. Consternation was in every face. They drew him to my very feet, insensible, dead. He was carried to the nearest house, and, no one now preventing me, I remained near him, busy, while every means of restoration were tried. But he had been beaten to death by the great wave, and his generous heart was stilled for ever. As I sat beside the bed, when hope was abandoned and all was done, a fisherman who had known me when Emily and I were children, and ever since, whispered my name at the door. Sir he said, with tears starting to his weather-beaten face, which with his trembling lips was ashy pale, "'Will you come over yonder?' The old remembrance that had been recalled to me was in his luck. I asked him, terror-stricken, leaning on the arm he held out to support me, "'Has a body come ashore?' He said, "'Yes.' "'Do I know it?' I asked then. He answered nothing. But he led me to the shore, and on that part of it where she and I had looked for shells, two children, on that part of it where some lighter fragments of the old boat, blown down last night, had been scattered by the wind, among the ruins of the home he had wronged, I saw him lying with his head upon his arm, as I had often seen him lie at school. 